All right, this Bible study is looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting at verse 1. It says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Think we're in the last days? What's cool in the last days here, I mean, obviously this is just something that's a part of mankind, right? I mean, this is uh, by nature, um, as sinful people, this is who we are and what we are. These are the things that we do according to the sinful nature. They are the products of our original sin, of our inherited state of sinfulness. Uh, as Jesus talked about, these things shall be on the increase as the day of his return comes. Um, so Timothy would have been living in the last days receiving this from Paul. Um, and we should just be seeing more of this today um, as this just continues to take place until Christ's return. Verse 5, despite people having all of these acts present in their life, it says, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Um, so again, we were all created in the image of God. So from each of us, we have the potential to do good. Um, God's law has been written upon our hearts. It curbs us from evil acts and pushes us to do good. Um, so that that's present, should be expected um, amongst us as being image bearers of God. But at the same time, Genesis explains that we have fallen short um, and that Adam produced, Adam's sons were born in his image, right? The Adam of image, the Adam of, uh, the, that image and not just the image of God. So with each of us, we, we, we retain an aspect of this image of God, but we also have lost aspects of this image of God, namely the holiness and righteousness that comes with be, and the immortality that comes with being created in the image of God. So um, we have all that there. And so we are in the form of godliness, but we deny its power. I think another way of looking at this would be um, all the people that say, you know, I'm a pretty good person. Uh, that say, you know, spiritual things are good. I pray. I meditate. Um, I love my neighbor. Um, I pursue peace. I'm a philanthropist. I mean, people are doing good things, right? And this moment even praise God. But the God they praise is not the triune Lord, the one that has revealed himself to us through the person of Jesus Christ. They believe in a higher power, a higher being. And they even sometimes will then say, God is in each of us, right? So they take on this form of godliness. Um, and this would be the New Age movement, right? Um, this, is, this is the current, current deal. We're all good. Everyone's sacred. Mother Earth, right? Uh, we're all a part of it. Um, and because of that, we're all, quote, godly. Um, but we deny the power of God. And by this, we deny who Christ is. A lot of people will say Jesus was a great person. He was a great moral teacher. He's a wonderful man to emulate and to follow. He is a prophet. But they deny who he actually is as being the transcendent Lord, who by him and through him and for him all things were made. And by him all things remain and stay, to get, stay held together. They deny that. All right. Paul t says to Timothy, have nothing to do with them. I would say the only thing to have to do with them would be to present the gospel. Do not partner with them, right? Do not claim there's peace between us when there is not peace between us. Verse 6. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. 
always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. I think this one also pretty interesting. Uh, these people which fit into this New Age movement, this type of thinking. Uh, any new spiritual teaching that comes about, their itching ears want to hear it and want to learn more about it. Anything, And generally what these uh, new teachings proclaim are ways for them to be happier, ways for them to be more productive, ways for them to um, love themselves more. Uh, these are self-help gurus, self-help lovers because they've rejected the transcendent God and instead have made themselves God and made each and every single person God. Every man is his own God, as Anton LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan, would say, an atheist, saying each man is his own God, except this New Age movement um, isn't atheistic. They actually do think we're all God. They think we're all sacred. They think we're all divine in some sense. And so any person that can help us tap into that goodness of ourselves Amen, right? And so they're always learning. They're always seeking new knowledge. But that new knowledge that they're seeking and gaining doesn't bring them any closer to the truth that they've been created by God, that they've denied God, that they're sinful, that they deserve death, that they're that, that all, of the, all of God's wrath should be upon them, that they deserve it. And they deny that Christ is Lord and that he paved a way through his life, death, and resurrection for them to have eternal life. That's what, they, that's what they're denying. So they're always seeking this new knowledge, always learning new stuff, and they're not getting any closer to actually having a relationship with the Lord that's true and real and has proven himself true and real through the person of Jesus Christ. They are just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses. So also these men oppose the truth, men of depraved minds who as far as the faith is concerned are rejected. But they will not get very far because, as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. As in the case of those men, this is Janus and Jambres, two men referenced here. Um, it says, as they opposed Moses, there's no one listed in the Old Testament that opposed Moses by these two names. But Jewish tradition says that these two men were Egyptian court magicians who were the sorcerers that emulated uh, the miracles that Moses was performing as a sign to Pharaoh to let the Jews go. Um, so these would be people that, you know, clearly had some power, were doing something, had some knowledge, um, but clearly what they were doing was not true. Um, and it became clear, I believe, as Moses kept popping off miracles that Janus and Jambres couldn't keep up. Um, and certainly Pharaoh did let his people go. So um, just know that these, these false leaders, these false teachers, they will have signs to accompany them. You will have experiences by them. You cannot trust those experiences, though. You cannot trust those emotions. Emotions change, experiences change, all right? What we can trust and look at is an empty tomb from 2000, almost 2,000 years ago that is still empty. We can look at the person and life of Jesus Christ and his words and see that what he offered is the best news ever, salvation free of charge, um, that he fulfilled the laws that none of us can meet. Even when we look at all of the laws of all the other religions, no one is meeting them. If you listen to anyone who follows another religion, they don't have certainty of their salvation. Hindus don't know how they're going to be reincarnated. I don't know a single Buddhist that says they've reached nirvana because they still experience pain and they still have desires. Not a single Muslim has certainty of their salvation because they don't know how Allah is going to judge them. Because when they look at the laws of Allah, they know they've all broken them. All right? Everyone is in a state of sinfulness. Everyone is in a state of fallenness, no matter what religion you're in. Jesus Christ is the only faith, the only person who offers a way. says you can have certainty of salvation because I have completed the mission. I've completed all the works that are required of you. And because of that, I'll take your penalty upon myself. And he did. And then he rose from the grave. Confirmation that he is Lord. Good news, right? Great news. Wonderful news. I can't stress that enough. Um, it just makes my heart glad. And it's the reason I just keep talking on this video, right? I just keep wanting to say that. It's good news. That's where we can put um, all our money. We can put all our chips there, right? We can take that to the bank. His grave is empty. The people that claim to have seen him 
lived their lives for him, denying everything earthly, living for Christ, spreading that message despite persecution that was coming their way for their claims. I mean, this is just good news, great news. And we got to just keep proclaiming it. And that's what Paul keeps saying. Don't listen to these people that claim they have something new to offer you. It's temporal. Temporal. That goes back to the chapter 1 of Timothy. No, actually, it's the first part of chapter 2 of Timothy. Right? Um, the athletes. That's actually a cross-reference um, to the second Timothy chapter 2. When athletes win their prize, it's a temporal crown. We're working for an everlasting, eternal crown. That's what you get with Christ. All this other information, it's temporal. It'll make you happy for a moment, but guess what? It'll wear off. Then you got to seek a new guru that can give you happiness again. That's it. If you've been searching and seeking, and whatever you're looking at, whatever you're finding is bringing, bringing you enjoyment for the moment, does that enjoyment last? Only in Christ can you get water that will lead you to never thirst. John chapter 4. Read that one. Have a good day. God bless you. Um, man, I'm really digging 2 Timothy right now. It's an awesome letter. Um, God's word's awesome.